Hello my goblins and ghouls, my name is Steven. If you're new here, a few years ago I started a project around an open source pick and place machine which automatically picks up electronic components and places them very precisely onto a circuit board. And a couple years ago I started a company around selling them. If you want the whole saga from the beginning, you can click here to catch up. A ton of stuff has happened since the last video, so I'll give you all a little bit of a company update at the end. But in the meantime, we're gonna talk feeders. Feeders, if you don't know, are little robots that automatically move electronic component tape forward so a pick and place head can pick it up. So we just have to move this tape that has all the little parts in it really precisely thousands and thousands and thousands of times. And last you saw, I had a prototype that was pretty much a bunch of wires all hanging out of a print, but it worked. It moved tape forward. We were using an encoder, this new film peeling mechanism, and we got it a lot thinner so we can fit a lot more of them on a machine. But then when I put one of these together with all the wires hanging out, but all kind of integrated, I realized that there was quite a number of things I needed to tweak. And so then we got this one, which is just, just a little bit longer. This is now Rev 7. And another huge difference that I made is the little pet G print that I had, which was for like kind of holding the feeder onto the rail, it just wasn't cutting it. It did not push hard enough onto the rail to make sure that when you mount the feeder onto the machine, it's not gonna go anywhere. So then I shifted to a little lever arm with a spring on it and oh, it's so much better. It pushes, it's like it holds the feeder on pretty good. And then I have this one and I'm testing this one, I'm making sure this one works. But then something devastating happens and I try and mount the feeder onto the front rail and have it interface with the feeder floor, which is kind of how the feeder gets power and talks back to the machine. So I try and mount it when the machine is on. And then suddenly my machine stops responding, the feeder lights go out, everything's dead. And I had no idea why, but then I realized if these are the spring fingers, the actual pins on the feeder that interface with the feeder floor to get power and communicate, and then these are the pads on the feeder floor, it's not like the pins were perfectly swooping in and touching directly. There's a rotation. So the pins were actually doing something more like this, where they were like sweeping across all of the different pads. And this is really not good because this means 24 volts is like touching a GPIO pin on the microcontroller. And like, the whole thing just shorts out, it blows out the chip. So I'm like, okay, what am I gonna do to fix this? I did two things to fix this problem. The first was just a geometry change. If the pins are sweeping in and like kind of swiping across all the different pads, you're gonna get a short. So I just made it so that the angle that they're at is perfectly perpendicular to the axes of rotation. So now the pins just drop perfectly in. And I added a bunch of protection circuitry to those actual pins. So even if you short them directly to 24 volts, it doesn't matter. It's gonna be okay. It's not gonna blow anything out. And that resulted in this feeder. And now you can see that the spring pins are actually mounted at an angle relative to the rest of the feeder. And this line, this angle is perfectly in line with the axes of rotation. When the feeder swoops in, and that's about what the rotation looks like, it perfectly comes in to the feeder floor. Look at that, that's perfect. No swiping, no shorts, just direct contact. So much better. Okay, so now we have a feeder that's really close to what we wanna ship, but there's still a lot of work to do before it's actually ready to go out the door. Also, by the way, we consider this our DVT design. If you wanna learn more about like the EVT, DVT, uh, PVT process of like bringing an engineering prototype to production, I'll leave a link in the description where you can read a little bit more about it. But DVT pretty much just means we have something that works it's time to put it through its paces and learn a little bit more about it and do some tweaks before we go into production. So, what do we need to do? Well, there's a lot of stuff to do, but there's three big things we wanna do around the design before we're ready to move on and prep to actually start producing them in bulk. The first one is validation. This is making sure that it's actually gonna do what we say it's going to do and putting a quantifiable metric to its performance. The second thing is lifetime testing. And this is running it into the ground and seeing what fails, what subassemblies fail and for what reason, and getting an understanding of how long is it going to last? What does fail first and how can we address that? And third, we're running a beta program. So this is taking a bunch of these DVT feeders and giving them to a bunch of users and having them try and use it and tell us what they like, tell us what they don't like. And then we can incorporate all of that feedback tweak and tune them to make them just that much better. So I've just finished writing the validation test and it's pretty cool. Do you wanna see it? It was so fun writing it. Let's go take a look at it.
Okay, so what are we actually trying to validate with this validation test? A validation test is checking to see whether or not a design hits all of the product requirements. Does it do what you set out to have it do? And for us, the main metric that we really care about is how precise is the tape positioning. Does it move to the same place every time? And if it's not exactly precise, what's the variation? Of course, there's gonna be at least a little variation, but how big is that variation? And that actually defines what parts we can reliably pick from a feeder. If the variation is bigger than the width of the part in the tape, then you can't reliably move to the same position and pick that part every time. So this is a really important number for us to know and quantify and have recorded, have some data around, so we can actually put some numbers to the performance of the feeder. So I'm not just gonna sit here and move forward tape over and over and sit there with calipers and measure how far, no way. So instead, I wrote a little script on this laptop which runs the whole test for me using machine vision. So let's run it, it's really cool. All right, so first thing it does when you run the script is it homes the machine, so we just get back to a zero point, and then it's gonna command the feeder to move just to make sure it's working. There it is. And then it moves over to the feeder position and starts taking pictures. And we're gonna see here in just a minute, now we have some machine vision running on the picture that it's taking. And you can see every time it takes a new picture, these white squares are pretty much in the same spot every single time. But that slight little variation in its positioning, that's what we're keeping track of. So what I do in the script is I find how many blocks effectively are in the image. And each one of those is a void in the tape. And I'm not measuring the actual component position because the component position changes. The component will move around in the pocket in the tape. What I really care about is the absolute position of the tape. So that's what I'm checking for is, is the actual void. That's what I'm looking for in the picture. And then I track one of them in particular and I find the center point of it. That's the red dot here in this picture. And then I log the position of that red dot and then that's what I can graph and I can see how precise it is over time. And then I can just let it run for like a really long time. <laughs> and it'll capture all that data, put it into a CSV for me. You can actually see the data coming into the CSV live as it's running the test, it's super cool. So I've been gathering a bunch of data about it over the past few days and I still have a lot more data to gather, but it's been really fun actually putting some, some numbers to how effective, how performant this thing is. All right, so where are we actually at with shipping feeders? We were shooting originally to have them out by the end of this year, but there's too much stuff to do to actually start shipping them in the next couple weeks. There's still a lot of stuff we gotta flesh out and a lot of testing and validation and making sure that they're going to perform the way we want them to. So at this point, we're looking like it'll be the end of Q1 is what we're shooting for, to start shipping by the end of Q1. That's our current estimate. So in the next few months, what we're gonna be working on is the validation and lifetime testing, running the beta like I was just talking about. But then there's also, tuning and tweaking the software. There's packaging design, there's drop testing. Even just getting the web store set up, that on its own is a huge thing. Never mind documentation and getting customer support ready and like, there's just, there's just a lot of stuff. There's so much extra stuff, aside from just designing it, actually getting the stuff out the door is such a different thing. It's also important to mention that we are only going to start shipping with eight millimeter feeders. We figured we could try and do eight, 12, 16, and 24 all at one time, but so many of the unique parts in most boards are passives and there are, most of those come on eight millimeter tape. So we figured let's do one and let's do it right and let's just focus on one of them and do it really, really well and make it the one that most people really, really need. And then shortly thereafter, we'll come out with the other three sizes. It's not going to be that much extra design work. We're gonna be reusing most of the CAD and the PCB will be the same. So it really is just kind of tweaking some of the CAD and rerunning a lot of the validation and lifetime testing. So it shouldn't be too much longer after we ship eight millimeter. The other three will be coming shortly thereafter. All right, now a bit about what's been going on here at Opulo. A ton of stuff has been happening. And it's also the end of the year. It feels appropriate to give like a bit of a like year end update about how things have been going, what's been happening here. Here. So let's get into it. All right, so first off, Opulo is six people now. We are six, six people. That is just infinitely wild to me. It's so cool. So it's me and Lucian and then Bryce, who you met last time, and then Gabe who does our documentation. And then we also recently hired Cody, who is another tech, and then Mitchell, who does customer support, but he's also gonna be moving into a bunch of other stuff. We also recently went to Germany for Electronica. Uh, Elector sponsored us to be there as part of their fast forward startup competition. And... <laughs> We got a huge freaking trophy. <laughs> Part of the competition was a pitch competition, so I got up on stage and did a whole pitch and everything, and thank you so much to Electro for having us out, and it was just a blast, and it was so fun. We also got to meet a bunch of you all. If you came by our booth at Electronica in Germany, thank you so much for stopping by. It was awesome to meet you. It was so much fun. There was a bunch of y'all that came by too. I really appreciate you coming by. It was so much fun to meet you. A lot of what we've been doing over the past couple months has just been trying to 
get rid of our order queue, like get rid of our backlog, catch up with orders. We've just had so many more orders than we expected to have. So we've been doing everything we can to just try and get machines built. How do we make our processes smoother and faster and you know, add more quality checks as we go, as we as we try and scale it up and make more and more of them. It's been interesting trying to figure out how to how to just make a lot more than we originally thought we were going to have to. <laughs> but that's part of what we got to do. People want big and place machines. We're here to make them. We are on track to catch up now, so that's great. The queue is is shrinking, and hopefully soon it will be very very short, and we can bring our lead time down and have a little bit of extra stock, hopefully even, which would be great. So that's been a huge focus for us. Is just how do we make these machines as efficiently and cleanly as possible, and while at the same time trying to juggle a new product introduction and MPI of feeders too, and trying to focus on getting those going and tested and. It's a lot to juggle. <laughs> all right, I think it would be cool to end with a quick tour of the office because I think the last time I took you all around, it looked very different than it does now. So let's go walk around and I'll show you what Opula looks like right now. Let's do it. All right, so we are in Tor now. This is where I set up my little shooting setup here. Tor is our meeting room. Uh, we got a nice big whiteboard. It's also kind of where I'll shoot videos. This is, I pretty much only ever shoot my talking head clips in this room because we got big, nice windows, a cool brick wall, and it's where I keep all my video equipment. But it's also our meeting room. So we have a big TV and our little conference table, and we don't take too many meetings, but when we need to, it's nice to have a separate room. All right, so we're leaving Tor now. So here's our little lobby area with the front door and a couch. And this is our little trophy case we got after we won the trophy in Germany. <laughs> Lucian. <laughs> and then here's Mendel. This is our SMT line. So this might look pretty similar to how it's looked for y'all last time I took you through. We got a few lumens here we use for making boards. We got two of our uh, stencil jigs here for uh, applying paste. All of our component storage. This is just what we're using on hand. We have uh, our inventory room has some extra stock as well. Our big danger puddle for doing through hole, which I talked about in the last video. And our setup for rework and testing and all that kind of stuff. Along with the actual rack where we keep all of the boards in various states of completion and testing. I kind of hinted at this jig last time. I'm gonna go in and give an explanation of what the heck it is, uh, but it's a cool one. It, it helps us so much with, uh, with making boards, so this will be one for later. We moved all our desks over here because production needed to grow, uh, so we decided to take our desk cluster from over here and shift it over this way just because we honestly just needed the space for building more machines. So here we have uh, a bunch of machines that are in the middle of pack out. So we're getting all the parts into their trays and getting them ready to go out the door. This is some new packaging we got with our own custom print on the box, which is pretty cool. And here's one of my favorite parts about it. On the side of the box, we actually have a circuit trace. This is actually the circuit for an older rev of the feeder. So this is an actual schematic that I just rearranged the, the layout of the PCB to fit on the box, which is kind of cool. Also, pretty recently we got this print farm wall set up. So we have, uh, we're still in the middle of building the last couple of them, but we now have 18 Prusa Minis. Um, all the black ones, the bottom row and the knees three were the ones that we had in our first batch of the farm and then we just got in another 10. So uh, Lucian's been building these up over the past couple days, uh, <laughs> buying the shelf and like I've been routing like power and lighting through it. So it's just a huge farm for printing parts for all the machines and soon feeders. And then we have a, a CR10 and a, an i3 over here. This is kind of our miscellaneous printer shelf, uh, just for extra printers for like R&D and other random one-offs for weird edge cases. Oh yeah, we also got in a custom color filament too. So we've been shipping a silver machines, but we got a custom gold color in, which is pretty sick. So we're playing around with that, trying to find a cool color combination. Here we got some more boxes because they didn't all fit over there. <laughs> and then Thunderbird, and this is our inventory. So this is where we keep a bunch of parts that are ready to turn into pick and place machines, aluminum extrusion, cameras, pumps, valves, 3D printed parts, you know, stocking them here so we know what we have in stock, uh, packaging materials, foam, you name it. Everything that actually goes into the machine stays in here and we track it all uh, with this web software called Aligny. I can tell you exactly how many M3 nuts are in this room. 
like to the nut. It, we track every single bit of our inventory precisely so we know what we have. And that is all Lucian. Lucian spends a lot of time making sure that that is accurate so we know what we need to buy and when. Back here is Ross, and this used to be our pick and place line, but this has turned into kind of R&D. Uh, so this is our nice EE -E bench where I spend a lot of time, and I got some uh, feeder tests I had set up there. All right, and then here is Ghidra, and this is where most of our assembly happens. So we got Bryce and Cody here, and we got a bunch of like sub assemblies being built up. So tool heads and uh, X gantries, and then here's a whole bunch of uh, Y gantry assemblies and staging plates being built up ready for this next batch. And this is where we make pretty much everything, aside from the PCBs, which happen in Mendel, all of the actual like sub-assembly production happens in here. And that's pretty much it. There's just a lot more infrastructure and like workbenches and shelving and so a lot of stuff had to get shifted around to be able to support the higher rate of production, but it's working. And we're trying to figure out how we're also gonna fit feeders in this space too. <laughs> All right, that's it for this one. The next video will be my year-end channel trailer like usual. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.